uh, and this leads us to uh, our next speaker. Actually, he will discuss uh, one of the subjects that was also presented uh, by Tom. Um, and this is uh, my pleasure to present Dr. Frank Vith. He's going to give us an update on EVAR for rupture abdominal aortic aneurysms. Frank? Claudio, be back here. I'd like to thank John and Claudio for having me. But it's also interesting that Claudio asked me first to uh, review the highlights of our New York meeting. And I actually started out and tried to do that, uh, but it really wasn't possible. I mean, uh, we had something like a thousand presentations and most of them were pretty exciting. And so I, I wasn't as good as Tom. I, couldn't, I just couldn't do it. And uh, I asked him to give me another title which is the one that's shown here. And hopefully some of you will come to New York uh, next year and, or this year and, and experience the meeting. And you'll see why it's just very difficult to, uh, to give highlights of a meeting like that. Uh, so anyhow, I'm gonna talk and give you an update on EVAR for ruptured triple A's. And um, the two things that I'd like to stress, which are new information, is the idea that 100% of ruptured triple A's can be treated by EVAR. Uh, and I'll come back to that. And most importantly, we keep talking about level one evidence, and there have been recently either presented or published uh, three randomized trials comparing EVAR to open repair for ruptured AAAs. And I'd like to tell you what those trials showed and then show you why the trials are, in my opinion, useless. Uh, and that EVAR is still better than uh, open repair. So I'd like to start out by saying that we all realize that peer-reviewed articles in leading journals influence medical practice and are important to all of us. And these journals, like the New England Journal, Lancet, the JBS, JVIR, British Medical Journal, JMA, et cetera, are the basis of our work in, in vascular disease. They're really our Bible. And it's assumed that these journals are reviewed and edited with objectivity and that their content is unbiased and reflects the truth. And in these leading journals, randomized controlled trials really are level one evidence. They're the holy grail and it's assumed by many that they're as close to the truth as one can possibly get. So this afternoon I'd like to show you why this is not so and how randomized trials, even in leading journals, can be misleading. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail tomorrow. Be misleading because of flaws in the randomized trials. And even flaw, uh, trials that don't have a lot of flaws can be misinterpreted and made misleading, largely due to the bias of either the authors or others who uh, further corrupt their um, findings of their trials. I don't have time to go into this today. We published an article on this about a year ago in the JVS, which you can read, and I will talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. But I'd like to say again at the outset, you heard me talk about it this morning, I have no financial conflicts, but like everyone else in the world, I have lots of biases, and we all do. So that's, that's my conflict of interest, I guess. Now. One of these biases is that I believe that EVAR improves survival with ruptured AAAs more than uh, open repair improves that survival. There are two key background points that I'd like you to keep in mind. And you, uh, Tom presented them in that first uh, article that he reviewed that single centers have reported good results with EVAR for ruptured AAAs. Ours was one of them. But we've been challenged because it's alleged that these trials are biased due to patient selection, case selection. So that's one important point to remember. And the other important point to remember is that there are a number of articles out there that say only 50% of ruptured AAAs are deemed suitable for EVAR. And there are many studies in good journals that show this. And I believe all these studies are flawed. And I'll show you why I feel that way. Some more background as I mentioned, is that so far, there have been no good randomized controlled comparisons 
of Evar versus open repair. So it's fair to say that Evar versus OR is still a controversial question. However, as I mentioned before, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit, you see there uh, doesn't show up very well. In yellow, there are three recent randomized controlled trials, AJAX, ECAR, and one that I've underlined and proved, which is the UK trial, which is a particularly large one and in many ways a good trial. And I'll come back and, and discuss those trials at the end of my talk. Now, the best previous evidence for the superiority of EVAR versus open repair is the single center and collected world experience that we reported in green there in the Annals of Surgery in 2009. There were a lot of good findings from this study, but there's only one that I'd like to show which supports that EVAR is superior. Uh, and this single finding in this collected world experience <clears throat> came from 13 centers who, like ours, used EVAR on all anatomically possible ruptured AAA patients. That means we used EVAR on patients who were in shock, no matter what their risk factors were. We didn't exclude any patients, and certainly not those that were hypotensive. And in these 13 centers, there were 680 ruptured AAA patients treated by EVAR and 763 treated by open repair. And if you look at the mortality, and again, I'm sorry this pointer doesn't work, down at the bottom in yellow, you can see the EVAR mortality was about 20% versus the open repair mortality, and MEDA's data was part of this. Uh, the OR mortality was 36%, clearly a difference in favor of EVAR and a highly statistical, statistically significant number. However, it wasn't a randomized trial, and there have been many around the world, and I've debated some of them, who say that they've looked at their results and they had poor results with EVAR for ruptured triple A's, and therefore our findings from that particular uh, collected world experience don't prove anything. Among these doubters, naysayers, were three controlled studies that showed no better survival for EVAR than with open repair. The top two uh, are from Europe. They're several years old now, but the one on the bottom by Show and Macaroon is a recent study from a very prestigious, well-known center in the United States published in 2012, and they basically could demonstrate no difference between the two. So it raises the question, why can some groups get good results with EVAR and others not? We and I believe that the treatment strategies, the adjuncts, and the techniques that one uses to perform EVAR make a difference and accounts for the better results achievable by some centers, as in the collected world experience and METAs and our uh, particular centers. These uh, strategies and uh, techniques and so forth, the way one does EVAR, that make a difference. I've shown five of them here. There are others, but one is to restrict resuscitation, something I've called hypotensive hemostasis. It's not permissive hypotensive. It's more active than that. Lowering the blood pressure, we think, has many advantages in these patients, or letting it lower. The proper use of an aortic balloon for maintaining control in the 25% or so of patients that need it, not in all, but in those. And that technique is tricky. I'll say a few words about it, but the details of that technique are published in an article. Uh, the first author is Berland from our group at NYU uh, and some others in the JVS, again, in about a year ago in January. And any of you who want to go into that technique can, can read that article. The aggressive diagnosis and treatment of abdominal compartment syndrome, which both Meta, we, and the Zurich group that are enthusiasts believe is extremely important in achieving good results. A key point, which I put in yellow here, one has to use EVAR on all possible patients with ruptured aneurysms that present, including the high-risk patients that many groups uh, exclude, because it's in those patients that the benefit of EVAR will become uh, demonstrable. 
and of course having a team, a protocol, commitment to EVAR, uh, and many other things. Um, now, I want to say one more word since I have a little more than five minutes. The, the way of, of getting balloon control is sort of outlined here. One needs a large sheath, which is inserted in the left femoral artery. The balloon, the supraceliac controlling balloon for the aorta, is placed through that sheath, guided into position, and then the sheath must be left in position and held there to support the balloon so it doesn't blow down into the aneurysm sac. And if you lose the sheath, you can't get the balloon out. So that sheath support, which I put in green, is very important. And with the balloon control, one then deploys the body and ipsilateral limb of the endograft by the right femoral artery. It's a little cumbersome, but it can be done, as shown in that Berland article. And then, uh, once that body and the ipsilateral limb is deployed, a second balloon is inserted through the right side, blown up in the uh, uh, body of the graft, and then the first, once that's inflated, the first balloon, supraceliac balloon, is then removed via the sheath which has been left in place. And then one finishes the operation. And this just shows a case. You can see the balloon on the top there with the sheath supporting it inserted through the left femoral artery, while the endograft, which you can see there, uh, the main endograft, which is inserted by the right femoral artery, is placed in. Uh, so it's a tricky technique, and if it's used right, it can be life-saving. And the other very important thing, and this is a slide from my colleagues in Zurich, Dieter Meyer and Mario Lachat, showing this uh, patient who had tremendous abdominal compartment syndrome. You can see the uh, demitus omentum and small bowel, which can't be left in the abdomen or it will prevent venous return and the patient will die. So by opening the abdomen and then the subsequent pictures show the dressing technique that these guys advocate for getting the nicely healed wound that you see on the left. And this case is for real. I took these pictures when I was visiting with them a couple of years ago. So the key point that I stressed before, but I want to stress it again because it comes back to the whole question of interpreting the randomized trials, is that you must use EVAR on all possible patients, including the high-risk unstable ones. Many groups only do stable patients, and that's totally wrong because the big survival gain, as I mentioned, is with the high-risk unstable patients, the big survival gain for EVAR. So now the superiority of EVAR, that was one shred of evidence. The superiority of EVAR is also supported by this paper which appeared in Annals of Surgery, again, very prestigious journal, about uh, two years ago, and it was written by Dieter Meyer, Thomas Larzone, Mario Lachat, and yours truly. And the title of the paper is Complete Replacement of Open Repair for Ruptured AAA by Endovascular Aneurysm Repair. And I'm going to tell you some details about this particular article because I think it's important. This article showed in two large centers over a 32-month period that 100% of the ruptured AAAs that presented at that inst those two institutions could be treated by EVAR. A few more details, again, it was two centers. One was in Orobo, Sweden, and the other was in Zurich. They had 70 ruptured AAAs at those centers, their big centers, and 100% of them were, uh, was possible to treat them by EVAR, although in 17 or about a quarter, a chimney or a periscope graft was required because the uh, necks of the aneurysms were not uh, ideal. Now, the results in this Annals of Surgery article, I think, are interesting because if you look at the second white line, only 4% of these aneurysms that were seen, that presented at the hospital, were turned down. That's a remarkably low rate. It's lower than any of the others reported in the literature. Most average somewhere between 20 or 30%, but in some institutions in Britain, it goes up to 50%. Ours was only 4%. And despite the fact that we're doing just about everybody, we had a very low 24% 30-day mortality, which is really quite respectable. So the conclusions from that, in that paper, in our, that study, is that EVAR is superior to OR, as I've already said, in my opinion, biased, and that clearly wider use of EVAR is supported in centers that are skilled 
uh, in doing it and doing it with the adjuncts that we've mentioned. However, many disagree with those of us who believe EBAR is better than OR for ruptured triple A's. I've already given you the background on that. So it's fair to say that for ruptured triple A's, EBAR remains controversial because there's up to date no level one evidence or good randomized trial to support its wider use. So let us look at the three recent randomized trials of EVAR versus OR for ruptured triple A's. And I'm sure nobody knows about these trials. Uh, hopefully nobody does so that they'll think this talk is worthwhile. Now the three randomized trials are the ECAR trial, which was a French trial. You know about those French guys. And the AJAX trial, which is a Dutch trial done largely in Amsterdam. And then there was the UK trial on the bottom, the IMPROVE trial. And basically, I've underlined IMPROVE because I think it's the most important one. Uh, interestingly, all three of these trials showed there was no difference between open repair and EVAR. Let's look at the flaws in the trials. The ECAR and AJAX trial were both small trials, and they were flawed. One had 107 total patients randomized. The other one had 116 patients randomized, and both these trials excluded patients in shock uh, and any other ones that were uh, unsuitable for uh, EVAR, they had automatically went to open repair. They weren't randomized. So they basically excluded those patients who were most likely to benefit from EVAR, as I've shown with the underlining there. And neither of these trials used any of the adjuncts that I mentioned for optimizing the outcomes with EVAR. And interestingly, AJAX, which I happened to review for one journal, but it got published subsequently in the Annals of Surgery, they only randomized 20% of the possible patients. I mean, that, that's a huge flaw, which basically invalidates the, uh, the trial and resulted in it being turned down by at least two other journals before it was published in the Annals of Surgery. Now let's talk uh, finally about the IMPROVE trial, because it's an important one and <clears throat> it was carried out in Great Britain with a lot of uh, falderall by Roger Greenhalls and Janet Powell. They've been talking about it for several years. And they basically did the trial in 29 high volume centers. They had over 1,200 patients, 1,275 patients, that were seen in these centers with a clinical diagnosis of ruptured AAA. For some reason, which I can't quite grasp, about half of these, 652, were excluded from the trial. That's a big weakness, but it's not a fatal one because it's only about 50%. And they then took the remaining 613, I'm sorry I don't have a pointer here, but you can see just above the yellow line, 613 patients were randomized either to an endovascular strategy or open repair. And this article has been widely quoted on the internet, it's been on Medscape, and in Vascular News, which is a pretty important throwaway journal published on, or publication published on both sides of the Atlantic, the headline was, there's no difference between endovascular and open repair. That's the headline. And that's the message which is being sent out over the internet. So let's see if that is the proper message. Again, the top of this slide is similar to the last one. 29 high volume centers, over 1,200 patients eligible for the trial, only 613 were actually randomized, and they were randomized to, as you see in the underlined line there, an endovascular strategy. There were 316, and there were 297 randomized to open repair. And the randomization took place before the CT scan was done. Interestingly, of the 316 who were randomized to an endovascular strategy, now these details are important, of the 316, only 275 really had a ruptured AAA. 41, or about 13%, had another diagnosis. Of those 316 and the 275 that, were, that actually had a ruptured aneurysm, only 154 a little less than half, had an EVAR. Oh, they were randomized to an EVAR strategy, but only half of them had an EVAR. 112 had open repair, and 17 had no treatment. Bad. 
of the 297 patients who were randomized to EVAR, there were 261 that actually had a ruptured aneurysm, about 88%. 36 had another diagnosis. And of those 261, 36, though they were randomized uh, to, I'm sorry here, I'm <clears throat> lost for a second. Of the, they were randomized to open repair, 297. 36 of them crossed over and had EVAR. So of that 297, or the 261 that actually had a ruptured AAA, only 220 actually had an open repair, and 19 got no treatment. Now, I hope I haven't lost you in these numbers because they're important, but I'm going to show you again how they, in my opinion, invalidated this trial. So again, we had 316 patients who were randomized to this endovascular strategy, and 297 who were randomized to the open repair. And the 30-day 30 more, 30 mortality in these two groups, after an endovascular strategy randomization was 35%, and after uh, open repair, the mortality was 37%. Now, that looks like there's no benefit to EVAR, because there's no significant difference between 35% and 37%, but you must look at the details. And here are the details, and I'm sorry there are a lot of numbers, and I'm sorry I don't have a pointer that works. But there were 275 actual ruptured aneurysms that were randomized to the endovascular strategy, the top two lines. Of these 275, I've already given you these numbers, but keep them in mind, they're important, 154 only had actually EVAR. And of those who had EVAR in that group, 42 died, which gives a mortality of 27%. In that group, which was randomized to EVAR, 129 had either an open repair or no treatment. 59 died. That's a mortality of 46%. Of the 261 actual ruptured AAAs that were randomized to open repair, 36 had EVAR. Eight of them died. That's a mortality of 22%. 222, 220 of those patients had open repair, 81 died, and when you throw in the 19 who had no treatment and died, the combined treatment in that group was 42%. So those are the real numbers. And if you look at the all EVAR mortality, it was 26%, whereas the all open repair mortality was 37%. And if you combine the open repair to the no treatment mortality and and the no treatment is much higher in patients under or randomized to open repair or candidates for open repair the mortality is 43 percent so the comparative figures for EVAR is 26 percent and for open repair is 43 percent now you tell me which treatment do you think is better how many in the room think that the treatments are equal how many in the room think that EVAR is better? Yet the paper says that OR and EVAR have the same outcomes. We'll hear more about it. The, the paper is published in the British, uh, Journal of, uh, British Medical Journal. You can read it. Uh, I've tried to read it. It says essentially what I've said. There are also some other flaws in the improved trial. They uh, used suboptimally fluid restriction Supercelliac balloon control, they, didn't, they don't believe in that. They didn't treat abdominal compartment syndrome. So probably the differences would be greater if they use these adjuncts. And clearly, all three of them improve outcomes with use of EVAR in, in the ruptured AAA setting. So my conclusions uh, that is that it's difficult to conduct a randomized trial of uh, treatment for ruptured AAAs. I mean, I think they improve all these three trial groups are to be commended for, for doing these trials, but it's really hard to conduct them in a meaningful way. There are several flaws in these trials which, in my opinion, and we should have some discussion, render them inconclusive uh, in the EVAR versus open repair controversy. I still believe that EVAR is the best treatment if it can be done uh, in a particular institution. Below 30-day mortality, now about 27 or 
25%. The many inoperable cases that can be treated successfully with EVAR that can't be treated, they're inoperable if one is considering open repair, they'll get no treatment, prove that EVAR is a better way to treat ruptured AAAs in anatomically suited patients if certain conditions are in place. And these conditions are, you have to have the equipment and the endografts to do it. The operators, whether they be surgeon or interventionalist, have to have endo and EVAR skills. The anatomy has to be okay for doing an EVAR in your institution. You may not want to do periscopes and chimneys, in which case you um, will be obligated to do more open repairs than, than EVAR. You have to have the protocol, the setup, the commitment, and everything to do EVAR has to be in place in your institution. And you have to do EVAR in an optimal fashion using some of the adjuncts that I've mentioned. But I believe that EVAR is feasible in up to 100 or close to 100% of ruptured AAAs, particularly if one uses the adjunctive techniques that the Orbro and, and Zurich troop, uh, groups use. So I presented my biased view. I'm sure there are others. You'll probably hear Janet Powell and me debating this at meetings all over the world, and she'll probably win. But those are my views. And thanks for having me, and thanks for listening. Somebody has to give an opposing view, I think, no? I have a question. Is there any question for Dr. Vitt? So, Frank, uh, I have a question. Uh, I, I saw the technique that you described, and we have used that uh, technique by placing the initial balloon right. when necessary, and then when that's the case, and you use a bifurcated device, you switch by placing another balloon or you go fast, you remove that one and you place it yeah, from the other it's side. Tricky. Yeah. So we have we have used that. But my first impression is when I have a rupture AAA is I want to exclude that the sooner the better. And I don't want to invest too much time cannulating the contralateral limb. So is there any data showing that aortomonoiliac plus occlusion of the contralateral iliac is better than bifurcated devices. What's your personal experience? I know that you have, for a long period of time, used aortomonoiliac. So what's your take on this? And I want other people's opinion as well. Well, it's very interesting because Claudio, I, and some other people invested in a company that made an aorto unifemoral device. and. Uh, I can happily say I have no conflict of interest because we lost a lot of money. And uh, unfortunately, there are, that company went out of business. The device worked, and we had the same thought that you did. Uh, but there are aortomani iliac devices produced by most of the companies. And in the uh, collected world experience, we couldn't demonstrate a difference between uh, unilateral and, and bilateral. I mean, I think you have to be able to do a unilateral uh, because sometimes the anatomy is not suitable for bilateral, but most people are pretty facile with the bilateral, and, and that's what they have on the shelf. Let me pull the audience here. Sure. For those of you that do ruptures, how many of you prefer aortomonoiliac? Raise your hand. I'm alone with Marcelo here. And most of you prefer uh, bifurcated? Mike, yes? You think there is time in most of the patients? The, That's the your irony is most patients give you the time. Yeah, you don't it's true. resuscitate them and hmm. don't transfuse them. Okay. And, and we always used to joke and say the important clamp is the one you paste up, place on the IV tubing so the anesthesiologist can't bring the blood pressure up. But Mario Lachat and his group, they actually lower the blood pressure, and it really stops the bleeding and gives you the time to do most patients. But Yes. Then you can com you can convert. You convert. Yeah. Oh, you mean? Well, you you mean that you 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 treat as they say with palliation. I mean, it's not palliation. It's it's putting them in the sending them to the undertaker. Uh, no, he says, which patient would you not do oh, would endo you do, do open? and you do open? No, I didn't say you do open. Ah. Anybody would ah. do down. 
No, no, he's talking about uh -huh. the turndown okay. rate, which uh, Matt Thompson talks a lot about this. The turndown rate in England is very high. And not in these 29 centers, but in other centers, it goes up to 50%. And they just, you know, they, I guess they don't treat anybody over 70 or something, which I think would be, be bad. Uh, yeah, I guess, that, yeah, I mean, sure. And, and if the patient dies in the emergency room, they, they don't get treated. But it's remarkable in the Zurich group, which I think is the best right now in the world, they have a system where they do this CAT scan right in the emergency room, and they treat the patient right in the shock room there. And their turn down rate's very low. Yes. One more question. Second balloon, right. and you may have to yeah. use a third balloon yeah. too. Correct. Yes. And the mesenterics. There's one point that I forgot to mention, and that is, once you blow the balloon up, if the hole in the aneurysm isn't excluded. You deflate the balloon, the patient dies. We had that happen a couple of times. That's when we went to the multiple balloon business. Now, we didn't have a lot of cases like that because we learned the first two or three that, that died. But you must keep control until the aneurysm is excluded. Sometimes it requires three balloons. 